Wow, thank you. Peace be upon you. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim In the name of God, whose compassion is infinite and encompasses all. Thank you, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Matson, so much for those incredibly generous words. They mean so much to me, especially because you are two people I have learned so much from and look up to. You know, it's hard to describe how it felt when Farhan called me to tell me about this award. Um, genuinely surprised, profoundly honored, and deeply grateful. I, I actually cried and, and then prostrated in gratitude, putting my forehead and nose, symbols of pride, to the floor. Thank you to El Hibri and to all the staff that have worked on this tirelessly. And for all the work you do to build communities and foster understanding, this recognition is especially meaningful because of how much I admire your contribution. I'm especially privileged to join the list of previous winners who I admire so much, Imam Majid as, as just one example. So today is a really big deal for me. It's one of those incredibly special moments you know, up there with like the birth of my kids and my wedding day and the time I got to meet Oprah. <laughs> I'd like to recognize my family. I love you so much. You are the most important people in my life. My kids, my husband, my sister, my aunt, my neighbor, and my countless friends and mentors who are here today. My ISPU family and most of all, my parents. I'm so grateful, flew in for this occasion, and you know it's a special day when the hardest working professors on earth canceled class to be here. You know, I grew up in a home that taught us to serve others. Our home was like the Ellis Island of Madison, Wisconsin's Muslim students. We always had a family staying with us as they figured out their new life in Madison. Someone in my family was always cooking for a neighbor or driving someone to the airport or devoting hundreds of hours to run a Sunday school unpaid. To pursue excellence was part of our family culture. A 98 on a test? What happened to the other two points? But leadership was not something that was coveted. It was not something that was even necessarily encouraged. So I never thought that a visible leadership position was something that would make my parents all that proud. I was a good student. I was a shy kid. And I basically just kept my head down and, and worked hard. But then something happened that forced me to change that. I remember one Monday morning in 10th grade where we were called to an emergency assembly. And when our 2,000 or so kids in our, in our high school in Madison all gathered, our principal got up and with a quivering voice told us that a tragic car accident over the weekend had taken the lives of four of our classmates and that one of uh, the fifth person was, was really fighting for his life in a hospital room. And as I heard this, I, I didn't know the four who had passed that well, but I did know Eric, who was in a hospital room at the age of 16, struggling to live. I had just seen him in physics class on Friday. And I remember thinking how fragile life was and how the only difference between me and Eric was that God protected me. It wasn't that I was smarter or, or better in some way, and that, that, that protection came with responsibility. It came with a responsibility for gratitude. And the way I was taught, gratitude was a verb. It was an action. It was about using what you had that you were grateful for to serve. And so as the weeks went on, we learned that Eric was stabilizing, but that he would never walk again. 
and that he would have to spend the entire school year in the hospital recovering and, and receiving treatment. And I thought that maybe there was something I could do to help, to show gratitude by serving. And so I went way outside my comfort zone and uh, decided to run for student council in my homeroom. And a part of that meant I had to give a talk in front of like 18 kids in my, my homeroom and I was completely terrified. But I did it anyway because it wasn't about me. And I don't remember if I ran on challenge. I think there was something about after school meetings. So uh, I won, you know. Um, and, and when I went to the student council, the first meeting, I, I proposed this idea of a peer tutoring program for Eric, that we could all, if we shared a class with him, share our notes, go meet him twice a week, and make sure that he was keeping up with his class, because otherwise he'd, he'd be graduating a year late. The idea worked, and I was, uh, I was elected to be my class co-president and to lead this program. And so I worked with Eric on physics, that's what I tutored him on, and other people tutored him on math and English, and so we would go twice a week to his hospital room and bring Xerox notes and VHS tapes. For the people in the room, you can ask your parents what those are. <laughs> And as a result, he got to interact with students, um, his friends, his peers, every single day, which completely improved his mood. He also kept up with his schoolwork, and when he came back junior year, he was all caught up and got to graduate with his class. What that experience taught me, though, was that leadership had to be a means to serve, not a goal onto its own. And that I was benefiting from serving. I got an A in physics because I had to teach it. I had to learn it because I had to teach Eric. And that serving is a privilege. And the first person who is benefited from that is the person doing the serving. And I took that lesson with me as I move forward in my life. Now, today public speaking is a big part of my job. I get to connect with people across cultures and geographies and points of view. But as much as I love what I do, it has not actually gotten any easier. I still am terrified to stand before an audience. So you know the feeling when there's a trap door and your stomach falls into your feet? Anyone felt that? So that's the feeling I got when I was invited to give a TED talk on the main stage. For anyone who isn't familiar, getting invited to, get, to give a TED talk is on a lot of people's bucket list because it means standing alongside Nobel laureates and celebrities and best-selling authors to share ideas worth spreading. It was definitely on my bucket list. So naturally, I felt completely unqualified. You stand on this big red circle on a stage by yourself under this huge spotlight, speaking to a room full of very important, accomplished people, really like this room. But then your talk is put online for millions of other people to see. So absolutely no pressure whatsoever. And as if that weren't enough, the stakes for me were so high because I was going to be speaking about my experience as an American Muslim in 2016 during a campaign season where my community, along with a lot of other communities, was being demonized and scapegoated. I was going to be using my personal story to give other people a voice who weren't going to be invited to that stage. So I felt this enormous responsibility, and it was like it was crippling. I was absolutely terrified. I wrote and rewrote my speech right up to when I was on the plane flying from Washington, D.C. to Vancouver, where I would be delivering it. I agonized over every word. I practiced and rehearsed and cried and rehearsed again. So I pretty much bombed the dress rehearsal. That is a figure of speech. It just means I did really bad for anyone who's concerned 
Everybody relax. <laughs> and so I spent the night before practicing endlessly, over and over and over, and finally there was like no more time to prepare. The day had come, and I was sitting in the auditorium at my session, watching the other speakers, of course all phenomenal, going before me. And I was observing the audience, and I was feeling how out of place I was in this room. I actually saw Harrison Ford, literally saw him in the audience. Steven Spielberg was in this audience. What was I doing there? So sitting there, waiting for my name to be called, I recited a prayer from the Quran that I always say before speaking. And this prayer is called the prayer of Moses. It's what Moses said before he spoke before Pharaoh. So another, you know, pretty intimidating audience right there. And the prayer goes something like this. My Lord, expand my breath, ease my affairs, untie my tongue so they may understand my words. And then it hit me. Moses didn't pray for eloquence. He didn't pray to impress anybody. He simply prayed to be understood. He was not concerned about impressing or gaining the approval of that intimidating audience. His concern was simply to give the gift of truth in a way they could receive it. And that is how he was able to address the most powerful man in Egypt, a man who claimed to be God. And I wasn't there to get my audience's admiration. I wasn't there to impress them. I was just there to give them the gift of a new idea, to be generous, to be loving to them. If my goal was to get their approval or acceptance, I would not have been able to take that stage. I would have been literally frozen in fear. But when I changed my mindset in that moment, I was able to share my story. Now, I'm not going to claim that it took away all my anxiety, but it did make it manageable. I started to feel a little excited even about what I was going to share. So they introduced my name, and with my heart racing a mile a minute, I took the stage and began to speak. If you watch the video, you will notice how my voice trembles as I begin. But I kept going, and I got stronger as I went on. I started to even get applause as I built my argument. And then, to my amazement, this auditorium of unbelievably accomplished people gave me a standing ovation. The talk's been viewed more than five million times. And even three years later, I still get letters from people around the world, from Brazil to Israel to Brunei, who said that they've seen my talk and it reached them, it touched them in some way. But my favorite letters by far are from young women, young Muslim women who tell me that watching the talk gave them confidence, made them feel seen. Those letters crystallize for me why access to prestigious platforms must be a means to serve, not a goal onto themselves. Today, I am privileged to be able to do research on topics of enormous meaning to me and importance as the director of research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Wait, you guys didn't know this was a fundraiser, right? <laughs> Altaf is here, so we can start. You know, we now live in a world where a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can get its boots or hijab on. Today, we need a a chorus of truth tellers to drown out the lies. We live in a world where 
2% of coverage on American Muslims includes an actual American Muslim voice in the story. The vacuum is not left empty. It is filled with a fire hose of falsehood manufactured by a well-oiled, well-funded machine called the Islamophobia industry with access to more than $200 million. We're often discussed but seldom heard. Muslims and their faith receive coverage that is 90% negative. Consumed by a public where only about half say they know a Muslim and even fewer claim a Muslim as a good friend. So what's the result of that? Over the past two decades, false information has been weaponized against vulnerable people. False information divides us. False information took us to a disastrous war. False information justifies discrimination and it drives unprecedented hate crimes rates. It's the reason almost half of Muslim kids are bullied in their schools because of their faith. But what if we all spoke up in the service of truth to protect the vulnerable, even when we piss off important people, even when we don't win Facebook likes? And I know Facebook is a sponsor, so sorry about that. What if we all worked for a world where perceptions and policies impacting communities were based in truth, where decision makers and the public could actually make up their own minds rather than be manipulated by fear? You know, this world is actually possible, but it's gonna take all of us, a tribe of truth tellers, we just have to choose between conformity and courage, between apathy and action, between a world where the loudest voices wins and one where the truth actually matters. So let us be truth tellers, even when it's uncomfortable, even when we don't feel impressive. Let us do it out of love and generosity and giving. Let us do it to serve. Thank you. Thank you.